Good evening, everyone. Welcome to TIFF Bell Lightbox. Uh, my name is Keith Benny. I'm the Senior Manager of Adult Learning here at TIFF. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to tonight's screening uh, and to introduce our special guest, uh, Curtis Tallway Santiago on Basquiat, as part of our series, Art Cinema Painters on Screen. To begin, we'd like to acknowledge that tonight's event is taking place on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are grateful to have the opportunity to gather together on this land and in this space. On behalf of TIFF, I'd also like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, as well as our major public supporters, the Ontario Media Development Corporation and the Canada Council for the Arts. Uh, we'd also like to thank our media partners for this series, Zoomer Radio and the new Classical FM. As a charitable organization, we'd also like to thank our donors and members like you for supporting TIFF's year-round programming and to help make our educational and our community outreach initiatives possible. I'd like to remind you to please place your phones on silent uh, during the talk. Um, tonight's event is part of the Cinematheque retrospective Art Cinema Painters on Screen, uh, on now until May 22nd. Um, for more information about the films we'll be screening, which feature uh, some of the most iconic painters and visual artists, um, please visit our website, tiff.net. Um, we're extremely pleased to be presenting tonight's film in 35 millimeter. Um, what you'll see tonight is an original print from 1996, so we're very uh, lucky and pleased to be able to screen it tonight. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, you to our guest uh, for tonight. He's an incredibly accomplished and exciting artist who counts uh, Jean-Michel Basquiat as one of his inspirations. Uh, so who better to introduce the film this evening? Curtis Tallway Santiago is a former apprentice of Lawrence Paul Yucks Willipton. Um, Santiago has exhibited internationally in solo and group shows, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, New York, art, uh, the Perez Art Museum in Miami, the Art Gallery of Mississauga, the Art Gallery of Ontario, and the Cooper Cole, which is also here in Toronto, the New Museum in New York, ICA at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, uh, Analix Forever in Geneva, and the Dakar Biennale in Senegal. So uh, very uh, accomplished and exciting artist, and we're really excited to have him here this evening. Uh, following his recent stint as an artist in residence at Pioneer Works in Brooklyn, he participated in a residency with Gallery Momo in Cape Town and Johannesburg. Uh, his work is included in the permanent collection of the Studio Museum in Harlem. So please join me in welcoming uh, Curtis Tallway Santiago. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you. How's everyone doing? In uh, true Basquiat style, I'm going to get everybody to say with me. We're going to say one, two, three, boom for real, because I need to loosen up and I don't want to just do some stretches here. So one, two, three, boom for real. All right. So let me start with a little bit about who I am. And I think it's best to start with some images. Uh, I'm a multidisciplinary artist currently based in Lisbon. And my work tends to center around the ideas of genetic memory and my exploration of ancestral imagination. If there can be uh, generational trauma, then why can't the imagination also be something that is tapped into? Uh, my career and my path has been one of following my intuition and connecting these dots, uh, the, what would seem like serendipity. So. This is a f uh, one of my first works uh, from this new series called uh, Red Face Ancestral Vision. And so Tall Waste, the name Tall Waste is because this is where my waist is. I was eight years old in Trinidad for the first time seeing, seeing my ancestors, my cousins, and it was a Juve celebration. And in Juve, you cover yourself with this red mud. And as the sun is coming up, I remember looking up at meeting my grandma and my cousins for the first time, and it felt like their faces were glowing, this red glowing uh, image. So when I discovered through exploration of colors this, I hit this red just with a can of spray paint one day, these memories started flooding back of that moment. So in my work, when you see the red face, it's talking to my ancestors. And so the reason why I went to Lisbon is because there was a painting that had been coming back to me time and time again, Che Fari del Rey, and it's of an African knight riding through the center of Lisbon, in, uh, and it's done around in the 1500s. And it turns out this knight is from the Order of Santiago. So I thought it would be romantic for me to go to Portugal 
and to, to make this work. And so I get to Portugal and within the first week, I'm on a, on a dinner date with some friends and uh, new friends and I'm sitting next to a gentleman who we start talking he's like, well, why are you here? And I said, well, it's this painting. It's been, it's been coming back to me, coming back to me. I tell him the name of the painting and it turns out his family owns that painting. So I was able to go with, and I was, uh, CBC was with me in Portugal. We were working on a documentary. I was able to go and view this painting for the first time. And that started my obsession with really looking into the medieval era and the, the, the last name Santiago in Portugal, because I had a feeling that it did not come from, often uh, uh, from the diaspora, it's connected to slavery. But we've had lives long before slavery. We were artists, we were mathematicians, we were scientists, we were poets, we were doctors, and I felt that there was this connection in Portugal, and arriving in Portugal, I've been rewarded with these things. So I'll flow through some images. Uh, this talk is going to go in forward and back in time, because through my work, I like to explore that idea. So this is actually uh, the first piece of my first painting, which I just recently was purchased by uh, the Studio Museum in Harlem. And I've only recently started to show paintings. I was more known for my sculptures, which I will lead you to. Uh, these are dioramas, these little handheld objects that I started in Vancouver. And more red face. And let's get to more drawing. Let's get to this guy here. This is Lawrence Paul. And he was the person, he was the, the gentleman and the artist and the person who started teaching me about ancestors and how through the practice of art making, we can connect to those who have been forgotten. And for and now, I know not everybody uh, feels this or believes this and I love that because we all have different things that resonate with us. And when I met Lawrence, I knew that this was the path I was gonna go on. And how I met Lawrence was seeing this portrait here, portrait of a residential school child. Uh, I saw it in a gallery, Bushland Mowat in Vancouver. I had a dream of the painting, and I had another dream of the painting, and one day in my studio while nothing was happening, I went for a walk, and on my walk, I come to this building in Vancouver, and I'm looking in, I'm like, man, damn, that guy's got a lot of Lawrence Pauls. And I look a little further in, and there's Lawrence, he's painting. So I knock on his window, and I ask him, I say, you know, you're, I'm trying to become a painter. You're my favorite painter. Will you, will you teach me? And he takes me in, and his work at that time was about connecting with the ancestors and the spirit world. So this, for me, as we lead to JMB, as I call him Jean-Michel Basquiat, this to me is the start of my, my, my path, of, uh, my, my journey as a visual artist. I was eight years old with my brother sitting at the kitchen table drawing, and my brother is an excellent draftsman. And we're looking at Picasso books and Rembrandt books, and I'm getting frustrated. And uh, I actually have a tattoo on my face of a keyhole, and the key is right here. Because when I would sit with my brother drawing, he'd always go like this to me. You're the key, you're the key of unlocking. And so he showed me this. And this rocked my world. It was Jean, one of Jean-Michel's last paintings called Writing Death, Death. And in it, I saw the lines of Rembrandt. I saw the lines of Twombly and Picasso and these people, but I saw something fresh and new. And that sparked in me that there was a potential to create something that was outside of the norm, something a little bit different. And I obsessed about this painting for quite some time. And this is the one uh, Matisse often talks about the story of having a small Cezanne in his studio. Well, I have a small reproduction of this that in times of trouble, that's, uh, that's, that's my star on the horizon and I keep coming back to it. So this piece here is Wet Dream. And it's, uh, one, it's my first diorama. And so as we're jumping through times here and uh, I'm in Vancouver, I've started to make these things. I've given up on my, uh, I was pursuing music heavily at the time and I thought, no, I need to shift directions for a bit. So I was making these and I'm in a cafe uh, in Vancouver <laughs> talking, uh, just, I'm in a cafe getting coffee and I'm listening to this woman tell another young jazz artist about the pitfalls of the music industry. And I turn to her and I say, you know, if I can, can do you mind if I chime in? Can I add two cents? And she says, yeah. And, she, and I said to the young girl, I was like, don't ever work with men in the music industry. And this is, this, is, this is a few years ago, and I'm like, don't find female jazz musicians, find female jazz producers, find a female manager. 
And so the 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 elderly the the older woman, this Cuban singer, turns to me and says, "Are you open to messages?" And I said, "Yeah, yeah, I'm open." And she says, "You have these things, these little things. You have lots of them. You need to you need to. These are important. These are going to be important. You need to keep track of them. You need to know where they are." And then she leads to, "There's someone." in your life that there's someone, there's an artist or someone that, that, I don't think she said artist, she goes, there's someone that you hold in high regard that's gonna enter your life in ways that you won't understand and you'll ride some of the highs and you'll ride some of the lows. And so I, I, I took that in and I didn't know quite, quite, quite to make, what to make of it. And these are, these are some of the objects she was talking about. Well, these, uh, this was, a, as, I, as, I, as we look at this here, this was a breakthrough piece for me. And this was, the, uh, this was made the day that uh, Michael Brown was found dead in the streets. And uh, it was a connection to JMB is because he lost someone that he thought could have been him to the death. He was a graffiti artist, Michael Stewart. And Michael Stewart was killed in the subways. And one of his, John Michel's famous paintings, a breakthrough painting, is of this, this man. And this was a, a piece, the, my first piece to show in a museum and was a breakthrough for me. And we were both looking at the past, looking at Francisco Goya. That's the composition here I'm playing with. And that is Ferguson behind you that you see. And those are US, uh, um, the, the military police. And there's Michael Brown. And there's Goya. So this was a moment where I, I I had transitioned in my career of making something that wasn't just about it, it. I don't even want to say I made something important. I made something that all I did was cry and let my hands move. And this is what came from it. And uh, yeah, um, hmm. it's still hard for me to look at those images. I've recently left America to allow my imagination to play and to interact in an environment that doesn't make me feel like I'm a target. And some people might say that I'm exaggerating, but uh, this, as I share just a quick story of watching a young man get killed on Facebook, um, and that, that week riding home from my studio at four in the morning up Myrtle Avenue in, New in, in Brooklyn, and I feel a car behind me, and I look, and it's a police car, and they just pull up beside me, and he rolls his window down, and he rides up the hill beside me, two of these officers just staring at me. And that's when I was like, I gotta, I gotta figure this out. I gotta get out of here. I don't need to be here. Um, well, uh, so yeah, my, 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 my mind and my, my talks work like a lot like Jean-Michel's paintings and bebop jazz. They're here, they're there, we're high, we're low. Um, so we're gonna go high again. And uh, the, as this, as the, the medium, the, the, the Cuban woman says, your life's going to change. I get a, a phone call a few weeks, no, maybe about a month or so later from the AGO. And they say, you know what, we're going to be having one of the largest Basquiat exhibitions in North America. Do you create performance art? And I said, yeah, I never really made performance art before. <laughs> but immediately what came to mind was his Caribbean roots, my Caribbean roots, ancestry, and carnival. And this is Peter Minchel, and this was created the year, the first year I went to Trinidad. And uh, this, is, this character here reminded me of the painting, Riding Death. And so I thought, well, let me turn Riding Death into a, a, a carnival costume, and we'll have a, a procession around the AGO. And so they're gonna, when, at the end of the procession, they're going to announce this exhibition. So here is my, my Riding Death. With, uh, we had 12 dancers from different walks, ballet, jazz, hip hop, uh, contemporary, just w if you love to dance, you could join. And we played Haitian voodoo music, and that was curated by Roland Jean, who the, one of the owners of, uh, of Rum Corner. And uh, he has a beautiful connection with Basquiat because they were showing works at the same time. And so he curated the music for me. And so we led people through the museum. And uh, we'll, 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 we'll hold there. We led people to the museum, through the museum. And as we get to the final point, they pull the curtain to announce, and this painting appears. And this painting is this work here. This work here is in Montreal. And 
as I'm telling this story, I maybe left out a little earlier, but right before, before I met the medium, I stood in front of this painting in Montreal and I prayed. There was nothing happening in my art career. People thought my boxes were kitschy, they were cute. And I said, I need help. I need, I just need help. Tell me, point me in some direction. So when they pull the curtain at the AGO and this painting is in front of me, things started to gel and I, I had no idea what was coming next. And what was coming next was a large dinner to commemorate this exhibition. And this table has about a hundred people. No, maybe my mind likes to grow and make it think it's much larger. Maybe, maybe there was about like 60, 70 people at this table. And, oh, that's better. And I'm sat next to this woman in this electric blue dress with an electric blue fur, and she's holding this little dog. And no one seems to notice this dog under the table. And I look at her name, and I'm like, oh, that's Susan Malou. That's Basquiat's girlfriend. That's someone who was important in his life. And we're sitting there, and the, 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 the and dinner's going on and on. And we haven't really spoken, because she's very guarded. And the governor general at the time stands up and starts talking about Jean-Michel. He was a black artist at this time talking about, and I could feel Suzanne's sadness. And because Jean-Michel never referred to himself as a, as a black artist. He was an artist. And there was, because the, with that label, then the world wanted, the art world wanted to put him in certain boxes. And he was like, I'm not about, I'm, you can't box this in. You've never seen this before. You can't box this in. So... In my pocket, oh, this is Michael who was sitting beside her. This is Michael Holman. You'll see in the film, he plays a character. He was in the Grays, John Michelle's band. And I'll get to the movie shortly. I'm holding this piece here called Sad Boy. I pull it out of my pocket and I hand it to Suzanne and she starts crying. And she says, this is exactly what Jean felt. Coming to the end of his life, this is how he felt. And she hands it to Michael, and Michael says the same thing. And the dinner ends with her giving me her number and saying, when you come to New York, call me, and you'll, we, can we can hang out. And so I spent that Easter, that year, I spent the Easter in her apartment surrounded by the few things from Jean she still had, and her telling me and looking at me and saying, he would have loved you. And that eight-year-old me, who when I first saw that drawing was like, there's something, there's, I feel you, I see you, man, I see you. To hear that, it created this confidence that allowed my drawings and things like that, because at that time I was only showing dioramas, it gave me this confidence to show my drawings and to, and to just think I could, I could stand on this stage with him. So I don't want to talk too much, because i got stories for days, um, I'll maybe tell like one more little JMB ane anecdote. And there's someone you'll see in the movie, a character. Uh, his, his name is Glenn O'Brien. So if people are familiar with Glenn, he was a great writer. He passed away uh, last year. He had a TV show called TV Party. And it was like Keith Haring and all, it was on cable TV. And they would just act the fool on this show. And so my friend Adrian and I were in New York. We're both in a, a in the sunken place in our in our in our lives. This is pre JMB really blowing up. Things are starting to gel, but we're both kind of like down. So we're like, let's go to New York and just like wild out. And we're leaving a hotel, and or I'm leaving the hotel to meet him. And I'm getting into a taxi cab, and the guy getting out of the taxi cab, we bump into each other like this. And I step back and I look at him. And I'm like, wait, you're Glenn O'Brien. And he's like, yeah, 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 I am. I was like, Glenn, do you, do you have a second? And he's like, oh, well, well, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, well, they're late, so yeah, sure. And I pull out work from my pocket. I'm just like, bam. <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, the only person to ever pull out anything from their pocket that impressed me was JMB. And he's like, this is fearless. He's like, here's my number. Be in contact with me. So, and I said, well, I'm getting excited. I'm like, oh, I'm working on this exhibition at the AGO for, for Basquiat. And he's like, oh, I've learned, I've lent some of my, my works to that exhibition. And so from that point, I just had these weird, weird, weird meetings. And now they no longer seem weird. If people ask me about my practice and what I do, it's just about connecting the dots. I believe in the... The, the, I believe in the imagination and manifestation. And my mom, who was raised Catholic, she now gets that, for me, manifestation is the same as prayer. 
and it doesn't have to be connected to the same thing she believes in. It's just letting your mind really believe that you're, 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 it's capable, it's possible. Um, I don't want to seem too Tony Robbins up here about that, but it really, my, it, the crazy things have happened to me the minute I surrendered to the notion that there's ancestors that I can connect to, and if I see a dot, as crazy as the dot seems, just, just pull it closer to the next dot. Um, so that's a bit about me. I'll talk a little bit about the film. I don't want to give too much away, so I'll just say a couple things that... The woman in the restaurant is Suzanne. You'll see this moment where he meets this woman in the restaurant, but really they met at a bar. And as she tells it, that at that time, he would take, Jean-Michel, he would take, if he sold a painting, he would go to a bar because he was trying to impress her and he'd buy the most expensive drink. He would spend, and he would sit at the bar and just like stare at her and sip on this drink. And so eventually she like got to know him and they, and they fell in love and he lived with her for some time. And uh, the fridge drawings, a lot of these objects, doors and things that she had a lot of those. But he's such a, par a powerful energy that uh, she, not, she told me that instead of selling the works where she could have got millions, she burnt them. She destroyed them because she, she had loved him and she didn't want to live with his ghost. And I can understand that. And she didn't want to profit because in the end, everybody just wanted to profit off of him. And he, he gave so much work away. He, just, he was generous like that. He, he always knew the value of what he was doing. His work was, he, uh, the first painting he ever made, he sold it for $500, and at that time it was a lot. And, uh, and the gentleman who bought the painting hung it right up next to the Kooning in his apartment. And so if you see the new documentary, Boom For Real, they'll, they'll talk about it. And it's a beautiful documentary because they really focus on, 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 on the, the joy and the energy that he had, not the drug addiction and the sadness. Um, so that, seeing that helped me enjoy this a lot more because I had a lot of bones to pick with Schnabel. He took a lot of liberties with his relationship and his connection to Jean-Michel. After seeing the documentary and hearing his friends talk, if you existed in New York at that time and you were an artist, everybody felt they were connected to him in some way because you wanted to be a part of some of that magic. And it's a beautiful film, and it's still one of my favorites because it was the first time I got to see a representation of him, a representation of an, of, of an artist whose skin looked like mine, who listened to the music that I liked. And so it's a great film. I was originally going to, like crap on Schnabel, but he did what he wanted to do. He's, Schnabel's work is about ego. He's about, he's, and so he paints himself in a light that not a lot of people agree with. So I hope you enjoy the film, because um, it's awesome. Even because what movie isn't exaggerated, you know? And maybe at my dinner story, there's only six people there instead of 60. So <laughs> who give a fuck? All right. Um, enjoy, and thank you so much for taking the time to listen to what I had to say.